Local programming on KRWG made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. This is KRWG TV, radio, online, news that matters. Now, across the Mosia Valley and the borderland, the stories that shape our community. From the KRWG Broadcast Center at New Mexico State University, this is Newsmakers. Thanks for joining us on this special edition of Newsmakers. I'm Fred Martino. Author Joshua Wheeler is my guest today. His book, Acid West, is a series of essays set in the borderland. He's a native of Alamogordo and now teaches creative writing at Louisiana State University. Josh, it's great to have you here. Thanks for having me again. We're going to talk about your book in, in a moment, but first I want to give people a chance to get to know you a little bit. Sure. Your history is very much connected to this series of essays. So I, I want to first ask you about growing up in Alamogordo, what that was like, and, and I'm, I'm sure it had a big influence on your decision for your first book to write about southern New Mexico and the borderland. Yeah. Well, my family's been in Alamogordo for seven or eight generations now. Um, I write a little bit in the book about how they ended up there. Um, but for most of my life, they were cattle ranchers. Uh, my family didn't live on the ranch, but certainly the ranch was a big part of our lives. It was sort of where the family was always gathered, where we would have church on Sundays and things like that. But um, a big part of my youth was my family's ranch sort of being in constant litigation with the government because uh, their ranch was one of several ranches in southern New Mexico that were um, sort of taken over by the government after World War II to create the White Sands Missile Range. Um, so I grew up in this weird space where we were very much sort of a traditionally Western family in terms of being involved in agriculture and ranching, but at the same time we were very much involved in sort of suing the government and, and dealing with things like uh, low flights from the nearby um, Air Force Base. and. Um, yeah, so I, I grew up in this space where this kind of stuff was normal, where we're sort of normal to, to see at the same time cattle and like stealth bombers flying, <laughs> flying low over the cattle. And it wasn't until I moved away from New Mexico and went out to California that I realized that this was not the normal everywhere. And I would tell stories about Alamogordo and I would tell stories about the ranch and people were interested. And that's probably the first time when I thought maybe I should take a closer look at my home and and try and make sense of it for myself in ways that I hadn't done before. I would imagine growing up where the family was facing this challenge, where the, the government was threatening your very way of life, would have a big impact on you personally and professionally. And, and I wonder if you think that's connected to kind of your life's path in some way. Well, I mean, in terms of the things I write about in the book, surely. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of things in the book have to do with the ways in which the frontier in southern New Mexico has changed as a result of the military industrial complex, as a result of commercial space outfits, um, as a result of, you know, sort of um, space age myths like the aliens at Roswell. Um, so, yeah, I think I was sort of primed to be attentive to those kinds of things. And a lot of those kinds of things are, are in the book. Um, I think also just any desert, not, not our desert in particular, but any desert sort of in the southwest is a place that attracts people who are interesting, you know, and who have weird stories and want to do weird things, you know, going all the way back to, to the beginning of the space industry in New Mexico with Robert Goddard, you know. Um, he was a guy who just wanted space to, to shoot his rockets. And I think a lot of people come to the desert because they want that space to do strange things or things that push the boundaries of, of what's accepted in other places. And as somebody who comes from a line of storytellers and who's interested in storytelling, there's really no better place to explore. You know, mm -hmm. I was just very lucky in a way that I was born here and, and got to know a lot of these stories intimately um, because they are fantastic stories. And they end up making New Mexico uh, and Southern New Mexico in particular a really important part of the American story. And that's, that's one of the things that I wanted to try and um, show in the book was how important southern New Mexico has been to, to the wider American identity over the years. You begin each of these stories, each essay, with the phrase, in the year of our Lord. Tell me about that. 
Well, I refer to the sun in southern New Mexico as our lord of infinite love and scorn, right? So um, today, today on my way here was 95 degrees, I think. Uh, I had to change my shirt before I came into the studio because I was sweating. Um, so that's maybe the scorn aspect of it. But we love the sun, right? Um, we feel like it's embodied in our chilies, and we feel like it's embodied in our lifestyle. And, you know, the architecture which we live in is as a direct result of the heat that comes from the sun. And so um, in a lot of ways, the sun is, is, is this god in southern New Mexico. Um, so that's sort of where that phrase in the year of our Lord comes from directly in the book. But also the book is a lot about faith and spirituality and, and religion. And um, I was certainly raised religious in southern New Mexico. Like I said, going to church at the ranch and then later going to a church in Alamogordo after the ranch had been sold. Um, and it's a big part about the it's a big part of the way I approach the world through this lens of what people believe in and what people don't believe in and why. Um, yeah. So that's that's maybe where that comes from. You know, and I can I can relate to your story very personally in that way, and the the idea, and you hear many people talk about this that when you have an upbringing in in the church, and particularly in a in a a very uh, a fundamentalist uh, church. Um, while organized religion may not continue in your life, faith, spirituality mm -hmm. does, and it's very powerful. Um, right and wrong is sure. very powerful. Morality is very powerful. Right. I sense that from you and, and your writing. Well, I think one of the things that happened to me when I started to move away from the, the religion with which I grew up in southern New Mexico was that I started having to figure out my own stories for why things exist, you know. As a kid growing up in the Church of Christ, you're given this book and you're given this set of stories and they say, this explains everything, right? Um, when I went off to college, I actually was a, a, um, a major in comparative religious studies. And so I studied all sorts of world religions and tried to get a sense of how other people had tried to explain the same things in the world. Um, you know, why there is war, why there is good and evil, how to follow those paths. And um, once you sort of step away from one story to explain all of this, you're left with a lot of uncertainty. And for me, writing essays has been all about confronting that. Um, as an essayist, I choose my topics based on things that I don't understand. And I say, this confuses me. I don't know why this is this way. And so I want to struggle to understand it. Um, and a lot of the things that I don't understand happen to be things that deal with um, the exact issues that I once thought I understood you know, when I was in a particular kind of religion. And now that I don't have that overarching story to explain these things, I'm left trying to explain it, um, I guess, in a more practical way. And that's why some of the essays uh, maybe seem at times like I'm confounded, because I, <laughs> I often am in an attempt to understand how we've ended up where we are. You're not alone. <laughs> You're not alone. I suspected that. I want to have you read from one of the essays now. Sure. Children of the Gadget, if you can talk a little bit about what this is about, the downwinders, and, uh, and then read from that. Well, this is a great example of what I was just talking about. When I decided that I was going to put together a book about southern New Mexico, I think a lot of people assumed that I would end up writing about the atomic bomb, which is such a huge part of our history. And for a long time, I said, no, I'm, I'm not going to write about that. Everybody's written about it. it you know, there's nothing new to say about it. Um, but then I spend it, started spending time with people in the Tularosa Basin who, in about the last 10 years or so, have really begun fighting to get recognized for the role that they played um, in the aftermath of that uh, test at the Trinity site. Um, they've never been recognized as official downwinders by the government, though other groups of people where nuclear testing has occurred in America and elsewhere have been recognized and given some sort of remuneration for being exposed to radiation, be it from uranium mining or from fallout um, from the test of atomic bombs. The folks who were the first people exposed in the history of the world to atomic fallout right there in the Tularosa Basin have never been recognized. Hmm. Um, and once I started spending more and more time with them, I realized there is still part of this story to tell. And this um, excerpt from this essay um, 
sort of captures the moment in which I realized I needed to tell this story. Okay. Um, so just to set it up a little bit, I've attended this um, vigil that the Tularosa Basin downwinders have. They light luminarias in remembrance of everyone who's died of cancer um, in their community. Uh, as a result, they're convinced of, of the fallout from the atomic blast. And um, this is me talking to one of the downwinders. Uh, his name is Henry Herrera, and he's one of the few people left in Tularosa who actually witnessed the Gadget's blast, and this is his story. Henry was 11 and up early, just before dawn, to fill the radiator in his daddy's Ford, always his first morning chore. The radiator on an old Model A had to be drained every night and filled every morning if you couldn't afford fancy additives like water lube or that newfangled antifreeze. And the Herreras couldn't afford anything fancy. This was 1945 and they were just like all their neighbors in Tularosa. Most everyone Hispanic and working ranches, growing and raising as much of their own food as they could and collecting most of their summer drinking water from the monsoon rains. So there's little Henry with his skinny arms holding a bucket over the fill hole in the grill of the Ford and what he remembers most is that his mama had laundry hanging on the line to dry. He remembers the laundry blowing in the wind. Kind of strange, he says, to have wind like that right before dawn, all her white stuff, linens and shirts and underwear flapping around. And then the flash on the polished steel of the Ford's grill and the dull steel of the bucket and the flapping white linens and the retinas of little Henry's eyes. Light, night turned to day, he says like heaven came down, and then the blast, and the shaking, and then dark again, silence. Nobody ever thought much of a bomb going off because bombs were always going off over at the Alamogordo bombing and gunnery range since our Second World War began. But this explosion was different. It was huge, and after a few minutes comes this little filmy dust, Henry says. Fine dark ash just came down and landed all over everything. Mama's clothes hanging out there turned nearly black, so she had to wash them over again. You talk about a mad Mexican. He laughs at the thought of his mama's face, seeing all her whites turn to gray, screaming, what the hell did you explode out here, Henry? So that's the story of how Henry's mama tried to blame him for the atomic bomb. It's funny, he says, until you know we was drinking it and eating it and everything else. But we didn't know that for years, not really until we started dying. Wow. Are you going to be reading this for an audio book? There is an audio book, but unfortunately I'm not reading it. Okay. Um, we got a great guy who's reading it. Um, You're pretty great, too. <laughs> well, thank you. At the time we were doing the audio book, I had just finished editing this, and uh, I wasn't sure I could retain my sanity while reading it one more time. So. <laughs> but I've got a little distance from it now, so I'm happy to read from it. It's, uh, it wasn't planned, but that was my next question, Josh. You know, you talk... And particularly this story. I mean, I was very touched when I read this, that this is a story that everyone should know about. And it's very, very sad. Uh, there's a lot of people who've had a lot of pain. There's been a lot of death connected to the atomic blast. And you talk in the book about depression. Um, tell me about how you work through that as an author, as a journalist, you know, I want to get close to stories, but I also want some distance to, to maintain a kind of wider picture of, of a story. But sometimes that's a really tough balance. And I mean, reading this story, I can only imagine how tough that was for you, because this is, this is emotional and difficult stuff. Well, I think that on the one hand, in writing all of these essays, I, I, I never tried to maintain any kind of objectivity because I'm from southern New Mexico. This is my home and it's the only home I've ever known and so I never said that um, or thought to myself that I was going to be able to remain objective about it. So in a way that's very freeing, you know. Um, but I think that all of the essays, this one in particular, involves a lot of immersion with the people who mm -hmm. the stories are about. I spend a lot of time with them both in this essay and then one we may talk about later, I spent two years with um, um, a group of people in Juarez, you know, going back and forth over the course of two years. And so you're very close with them at times, but then the book also includes a lot of research, a lot of archival work. And um, it's easy to get a little bit of distance from the human stories when you're, when you're in the archive. And that balance is a tough thing to, to maintain. You want the immediacy of people's stories and 
you want to be able to feel the emotion yourself so that you can invade their emotion authentically as possible, but you also want to have a little bit of um, distance so that you can give the, the wider context so that people will understand that this is not just one small group of people's emotions, but um, you know, part of a, a broader historical narrative. Um, and so it's difficult, and the book does deal with a lot of grim stuff. And people have asked me at times, you know, why did you only write about the grim things in southern New Mexico? And um, I certainly didn't mean to. I just think that some of the stories that I didn't understand tended to be a little bit grim and depressing. And um, I hope that the intensity with which I went into trying to tell these stories and, and researching them and putting them in the context of the American experience shows how much I care for this place, even though some of the stories um, are a little bit on the grim side. Yeah. You worked as a journalist, I know, at the Alamogordo Daily News. Tell me about the decision to teach and stay in nonfiction yeah. with these, these essays, but, but in a different form. It's not the Daily News grind. It's, as you pointed out just now, you don't have to well, be objective. I was right? never really in the Daily News grind. Mm -hmm. um, my, the majority of my experiment, uh, experience with the Alamogordo Daily News was delivering newspapers. Mm -hmm. um, I wrote maybe freelance a few articles for them, a few articles for the Las Cruces Sun News, but um, by and large, my, my, my um, sort of trajectory as a writer came um, out of my experience here at NMSU. Uh, I was in poetry school here. I did my MFA in poetry here at NMSU. Um, and then I spent a few years adjuncting to pay the bills in, in Tucson and then back here. And um, So writing for the, the newspaper, but on a freelance basis, never thinking that you were going to do that full time as no, a reporter. And, no, and I don't claim to be a journalist. I've never mm -hmm. been to journalism school. Um, that's one of the reasons I can say I'm not objective, <laughs> you know, is I've, I've not had that training. Um, but, I, you know, there have been stories I've wanted to tell that I've used uh, journalistic outlets for mm -hmm. over the years, and um, that's been great. But, but by and large, um, what I write are these essays that, are more about my attempt to understand something than yeah. they are about trying to just communicate the basic facts, which is what you're doing in the daily grind of a, of a journalism yeah. job. Yeah. Well, I don't want to run out of time, and you've already mentioned this next uh, essay, A Million Tiny Daggers, this one set in Juarez. Well, so this is a good example of what I was talking about in terms of not being a journalist actually frees me up to mm -hmm. sort of have a little bit more um, imagination at play in the essays. And this was a tough story to write because it was in the wake of um, the cartel wars in Juarez and um, just the constant poverty there. And um, I was following around an acupuncturist who was teaching people in a particular asylum in Juarez and then um, also nuns in different um, parishes in Juarez to use acupuncture to try and treat one another. And this is towards the end of the essay in which um, after two years of uh, trying to understand how this was working and how it was healing the city, I, I go ahead and have acupuncture at the um, Chapel Santa Margarita um, deep in, in, in Juarez. After a year of chasing needles, I finally recline with others, submit my flesh to steel, a new communion without blood or wine or crumbs. It feels like art somehow, us all collapsed into a painting or performance, but also outside it gazing in, staring at one another in the circle, each without our shoes or socks, pants rolled up, needles sticking out of our foreheads and feet and ears, each meditating on his or her own anxieties, but also watching the others in the circle meditate on their anxieties and illness and pain and depression and despair. It is the first time in a long time that I've been comfortable in a church. The recliners are an improvement on pews, but the steel tingles a bit in the skin and it is easy to imagine it catching the frequency of angst broadcast by all the other steel and all the other skin. It is easy to imagine the needles as receivers and broadcasters of pain, a network that, if spread wide enough, may in some equitable and tolerable proportion disperse the pain. For many of us, that means we must feel more, be less comfortable. It is easy to imagine that Rudolfo and his children will have a peaceful life that he will one day get a shop in which to butcher hogs and the dark red stain and the dirt outside the front door of his house will fade. Easy to imagine that all the dark red stains will fade or be obliterated by a fresh coat of peach paint. 
It is easy to imagine that Josefina's daughter and son will never have to witness the decapitations of their colleagues on the Juarez police force. Easy to imagine that El Pastor's asylum, Elizabeth will get needled enough and get well enough that she walks out of the asylum and finds her children and moves again to California, where she will live her life out on the beach, watching her babies swim out beyond the white breakers, swim back to shore, grown and full of vigor. It is easy to imagine El Pastor building out on the outskirts of water as a Rome of such splendor that no one in the place wants for anything or suffers from anything. It is easy to imagine that El Diario will go the vanishing way of so many newspapers, not because the reporters keep turning up assassinated, but because they will have nothing to report beyond relative happiness and deaths of old age. It is easy to imagine that name after name on Sister Betty's wall of the disappeared will themselves disappear the scrolls rolling up on themselves without the weight of mournful ink to make them unfurl. It is easy to imagine that the needles will spill out of this chapel and into the streets and into all the labyrinthine inlets of side intelligencers so that everyone in the city becomes a little less anxious. Easy to imagine that the needles will spill even farther, that there will be such demand that even the big steel wall prying open the wound of La Frontera will need to be torn down to make enough needles. Ah but who will slave in that factory? It is easy to imagine that the Catholic Church in a hundred years, all the priests placing a wafer on the tongues followed by all the nuns slipping needles into ears, sisters Maria Rosario and Maria Esther of Santa Margarita becoming the patron saints of the needling nuns. It is easy to imagine that, given enough time, all of the world's religions and superstitions and pseudosciences will blend into one practice easy to imagine that this is finally and only what is really human, unreasonable faith, that as our bodies evaporate into the cloud of information that now besieges the ever wobbling earth, one small pocket of something like the old humanity will be left, a tribe whose practice includes sitting still and quiet in a warehouse chapel in the wake of a crucified man with needles in their ears. It is easy to imagine every labyrinth unfurling into a straight path, easy to imagine the human ear flattening, evolving to become nothing but a platform for our new network of dispersing pain in tolerable and equitable proportions. A simple steel implement, pew, 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 in the hands of a desert tribe crawling to the edges of the earth and over them, moving ear by flattened ear in search of ever more flesh to remind that it is flesh, that it must feel its portion too. It is easy to imagine. Acupuncture in, in Juarez, two years uh, on this. Tell me uh, what kept you with this story. Well, uh, a couple of things. I think on the one hand, it was the passion of, of Ryan Bemis, who is the acupuncturist that first started doing this. Um, he has a clinic here in Las Cruces called Crossroads Acupuncture. Um, and in addition to, to doing community acupuncture here, he started um, going across the border and training for free people in these different communities who were getting no other kind of health care. And so his passion kept me coming back. Yeah. Um, but then also the people I was meeting there and the ways in which they were taking to the acupuncture. Yeah, very powerful stuff. So since the final uh, essay that you, you've read here uh, on this show was set in Mexico, I think it's a, a good time and a good way for us to conclude our time together today to ask you what you make of what's happening uh, in the country right now politically with a president that critics say uses Mexico, uses the border and the fear of others as a political tool. Well, in the book at the beginning we have a map of southern New Mexico and one of the things that I really fought for in that map was to make sure that there were no borders on that map and so if you look at the map at the beginning of the book you can see that there's New Mexico and Texas and Mexico, and they're labeled, but there are no borders there. Um, and that's an idea I got from uh, Leslie Marmon Silco, who's a writer who's written a lot about this area and the Southwest in general. And she talks about her, her heritage in which there were no borders and that borders make no sense. And that's a philosophy that, that I certainly have. And so anyone who tries to use something as um, false, something as manufactured as a border to um, stoke fear in order to, to, to drive some kind of political rhetoric or achieve some political end is somebody who I think is mistaken and somebody who hasn't spent any time in this region and knows what the importance of, of the cross-cultural connections that we have are. So um, 
I think the border wall is absurd, um, for sure. And I think that many of the policies that our government has had, not just now, but over the course of many years, has caused um, a lot of problems for, for the people in Juarez. Um, and seeing them get even just a little bit of relief from, from the acupuncture was, was heartwarming and made me think that there are things that we can do that can make their situation and our situation much better. Yeah. And what gets lost so often in this discussion is the, this is such an integral part of our community, of where we live, that we have three states and sure. two countries and the cultural richness. What has that meant to you and your life and your writing? I mean, I think it's meant to everything. It's a, it's a huge part of who I am. Growing up as close as I did to the border and, and um, a family, my family was a family that at different times, you know, had to, had to be displaced from where they, they were at. Um, and they were able to find a home here in southern New Mexico. And I would like anybody who's been displaced by any sort of um, chaos at home to be able to find a home here in southern New Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, that's one of the reasons that I write the book is to show that um, southern New Mexico is a place where there are a lot of different kinds of people and a lot of different kinds of culture. And that that, that milieu has caused some problems in terms of the, the military coming in. But as far as the, the people, by and large, I think we're better off for it. And we're a special kind of people because we've been exposed to such diversity. Josh Wheeler, the book is Acid West. I hope you'll be back uh, when you write your next, or I should say publish your next book. Me too, me which too. Which will be a novel. You're going to get away from <laughs> Nonfiction. I'm I don't not, blame you. I'm not leaving Southern New Mexico, though. <laughs> You're the uh, the novel will stay in S and M. All right. Safe travels to you, and thank you for being here. Thanks for having me, Fred. Thank you at home. I'm Fred Martino. Have a great week.